Like Ode on Melancholy, Keats's Ode to a Nightingale begins in great agony. My heart aches, and a drowsy numbness pains my sense as though of hemlock I had drunk, or emptied some dull opiate to the drains one minute past, and lethe words had sunk. There's the aching of the heart, but then there's a feeling that the poet might actually be, be poisoned um, and on the verge of, of sinking into death, or, or at the very least uh, is, is, is intoxicated um, by some dull opiate. Not intoxicated, that's not the right word. He's being shut down. Um, he's going into the realm of sleep. But just when when the the poet seems to be on the merge, uh, verge of like going into the, into unconsciousness into darkness, suddenly appears in his psyche anyway in his mind a bird um, where he says, out of nowhere, "Tis not through envy of thy happy lot, um, but being too happy in thine happiness, thou light winged dryad of the trees, in some melodious plot of beech and green and shadows numberless, singest of summer in full throated ease." So there's a feeling that okay, I'm in pain. But this bird suggests to me um, a way out of the pain. The bird has everything I don't. Um, it, is, it can sing whenever it wants to. Uh, it gets to live in a realm of green. Uh, it, the bird in, in dwelling in shadows numberless lives in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a place of pure possibility. And it is a bird of summertime. So vitality, uh, beauty, uh, possibility. These are the virtues that the depressed and perhaps dying poet associates with this bird. So this is one of the, this is the primary tension in the poem. It's between um, the poet suffering his own physical world as one of great agony and him imagining the bird as a way out of the agony. And we see this very clearly in, in the second stanza where the bird goes away, but the poet lays out this fantasy of, of escaping his, his current painful situation, not through the song of the bird, but through other means. He says, oh, for a drought of that vintage uh, that had been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth, tasting of flora and the country green, dance and Provencal song and sunburnt mirth. Uh, uh, Oh, for a beaker full of the warm south, full of the true, the blushful hippocrine, with beaded bubbles winking at the brim and purple-stained mouth, that I might drink and leave the world unseen and with thee fade into the forest dim. So, well, maybe I can get with thee, bird, through drinking something, through drinking wine. Uh, maybe that will release me from my pain. Well, what kind of wine? Is this the kind of wine you can buy at the grocery store? Um, no, um, it's been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth and it tastes of Provencal and country song and sunburnt mirth. So it's a kind of idealized wine that might, upon drinking it, lead the poet out. But note that one of the features of the wine is it's very tasty and it, 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 it's, it's sensually pleasurable. The poet doesn't want to sip daintily the wine. He wants to quaff it back hard and get a, get a wine mustache. As he says, I want a purple stained mouth. So this gives us a feeling early on that, well, wait a minute. The world, that physical world that hurts the poet so much that he wants to escape, well, this same world gives the poet sensual pleasure too. So there's an ambiguity suggested in the poet's relationship to this physical world. Well, he doesn't quite know that yet. So in stanza three, he says, look, I want to get out of here. I want to fade away into the forest with you, bird. Why? Because here is a place where men sit and hear each other groan. Um, what we're but to think is to be full of sorrow and leaden eyed despair. Um, where uh, the youth grows pale and specter thin and dies, and beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes, or new love pineth in beyond tomorrow. This world's a terrible place. Um, we grow old and die. Young men get sick and die. Uh, beauty fades. Love fades. So I'm going to fly away with thee. But maybe Bacchus isn't the way. Maybe wine isn't the way to get with thee. Maybe poetry is. And that's what the poet explores in stanza four. That maybe I can imagine um, a poem about you, about you, bird, uh, nightingale, being uh, in, in, in the realm of the moon. Uh, and we have this lovely poetry, right? I'm already with thee. I've imagined myself with thee. And tender is the night. This is the line that, of course, F. Scott Fitzgerald used um, to title one of his novels. Tender is the night, and happily the queen moon is on her throne, clustered round by all her starry fays. But here there's no light. 
save what from heaven is with breezes blown through virtuous glooms and, and winding mossy ways. So here, right before stanza five is a shift where the poet suggests, okay, if I can get with the bird and go up into the realm where the bird lives, the sky realm, where there is a queen moon and beautiful fairies, that's great. But I'll be in darkness then. I'll be alienated from the physical world. And what will that mean? He says in stanza five, I won't be able to see what flowers are at my feet. I won't be able to experience the white hawthorn and the pastoral eglantine, the fast fading violets covered up in leaves. And mid-May's eldest child, the coming musk rose full of dewy wine, the murmurous haunt of flies on summer eves. So I'll be alienated from the physical world, the sensual pleasure of the physical world. So what is the poet to do? Stanza six, he says, almost as if he realizes his own dilemma. Uh, he loves a world that hurts him. <laughs> the world that hurts him, he loves. So what to do? Darkling, I listen. He returns to himself, um, listening to the nightingale, as if, as if his, his flights of fancy all, all up into the moon, he's pulled them back in. Darkling, I listen. Dark, I'm in the dark, but also darkling suggests my soul is dark too. That dark word darkling is a very important word in King Lear. Um, also, Thomas Hardy uses it in his poem, The Darkling Thrush. Darkling, I listen, and sometimes I've thought about killing myself. I've been half in love with easeful death and called him names in many amused rhyme. So maybe I'll just kill myself. That Maybe that's a way to escape. Maybe I shouldn't escape through wine. Maybe I shouldn't escape through poetry. Maybe I'll escape through su suicide. But then he goes, well, wait a minute. If I did that, you'd still sing, Nightingale. And I would not hear. To thy high requiem, I would become a sod. So what to do? He shifts now in stanza seven away from himself, too painful, too darkling, too suicidal, and he imagines the bird, not as a physical bird anymore, even though early on he called it a, a light-winged dryad. So there's never a sense that this is a physical bird quite anyway. It's part imaginative bird, part imagined bird, and part actual bird. He says, you were not born for death yourself, immortal bird. You've been around forever. You've been around um, in the age of, of the Bible, um, when, sad, when Ruth was sad, sick for home, um, crying amid the alien corn. And you were around, not even in, 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 in the world of fairy, um, where there, you were there in perilous seas and fairy lands forlorn. So again, he's throwing his imagination out um, beyond his physical condition and imagining the bird uh, being both spatially infinite um, and temporally uh, essentially infinite too. It transcends space and time. It transcends the pain of space and time. Forlorn, forlorn. And that very word, the poet says in, this, in the final stanza, is like a bird, I'm sorry. <laughs> that word forlorn is like a bell tolling him back to his soul self. So he's back where he began in the beginning of the poem with an aching heart. Um, all these flights of fancy ultimately have not allowed him to escape his pain. Here he is with an aching heart. And he says, look, the fancy cannot cheat so well um, as she is famed to do. I cannot imagine myself out of this pain. I can't imagine myself up on the moon with you. Um, and as he's saying this to himself, he hears the bird song moving further and further and further and further away, past the near meadows, over the still stream, up the hillside, and now it is buried deep in the next valley glades. And then these final two lines, which throw the whole poem in doubt. Um, was it a vision or a waking dream? What just happened? Um, in, 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 in thinking about the bird in these ways, did I have a kind of vision of insight, a revelation? Have I learned something new about myself and the world? Or was it a waking dream? Was I just in a hypnagogic state uh, where I was fading in and out of fact and fantasy and, and haven't really learned anything, but I've just been in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a murky world? Well, the last line, fled is that music. That's all I know. <laughs> the music's gone. The nightingale's gone. Do I wake or sleep? Oh, very haunting final line. Um, has the poem been a dream? Has the poem been waking? At the end of the poem, has the poet um, gained insight or has the poet simply indulged in a kind of dream? We don't know. So we, like the poet, are faced with a mystery. The poet is asking himself, what is the nightingale? 
Um, is it a real bird that I want to experience sensually as I want to drink wine and, and experience it sensually? Or is it a mythological bird that might somehow take me out of my personal pain? What is it? He, he doesn't quite know, just as we don't quite know what this poem was, a revelation or a dream. But just as the poet is, is activated into thought by the bird, so we are activated into thought by the poem. Remember, the poem opens with the poet feeling numb, um, on the verge of unconsciousness. But the poem shows a very active, agile mind come to life. So even though the bird itself remains ambiguous, ultimately that ambiguity is good because it inspires rich, varied, dynamic thought. And just as the poem itself, though ambiguous at the end, this is good because it activates us to think about the meaning of the poem and we ourselves are shocked out of some kind of interpretive numbness.